uh, schedule for this evening will be will tell us what we usually get to know and reintroduce the person, who they are and where they're from. That'll come out in her talk. How's that, Victoria? Good to see you. Happy to hear I'm very glad for this way <coughs> of introduction. For well, the first time when I came in America, I had to get used of the American way of, intro- of being introduced. Sometimes I got almost a headache by the heat of the halo that people make around my head. <laughs> but this time I learned very much from the woodpecker. You know, the woodpecker, he uh, was sticking with his beak against the stem of a tree, and the very same moment, the lightning struck that tree and destroyed it. And the woodpecker flew away, and he said, My, I didn't know that there was so much power in my beak. (laughs) When there's power uh, this afternoon, it is not by the power in my beak, but by the Holy Spirit. And I hope you will pray that I will not stand in the way. For we all need a great blessing, all of us. We are standing in the front line of the battle. And I have the assurance that never the battle has been so severe as in this time. The powers of darkness and the powers of light are fighting together and you and I stand between them. And now it is very important that we realize and that we see the reality. For I believe that not the communists are the greatest danger for this world, but I believe that powerless Christians are the greatest danger for this time. And it is not necessary that you and I are powerless because the Lord means business with his promises. And when he has said, I will give you power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, then we know that we are living in a time that the Holy Spirit is here and that we have all the power that we need in the Holy Spirit. Now it is only the question not to ask more of the Holy Spirit, but to give more to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here, and He's willing to fill you and to give you the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And I will speak today about 1 Corinthians 13, and I believe it is good that I tell you a little bit about uh, what I have seen the last years going over the world, speaking in many different congregations, and I have seen that the Lord is doing a great work, sometimes in congregations where I had not expected it, and the Holy Spirit is poured out in the churches and miracles are happening so that I almost believe or I really believe that these are the days of what God spoke through Joel that he has said I will pour out of my spirit on all and old people will dream dreams and young people will see visions and now it is a very important thing that you and I see the reality and that's why I will read for you now 1st Corinthians 14 uh, 8 to 11 I read it from the translation of Phillips because that's an English that even a Dutch can understand <laughs> one man's gift by the spirit is to speak with wisdom and others to speak with knowledge the same spirit gives to another man faith to another the ability to heal, to another the power to do great deeds. The same Spirit gives to, to another man the gift of preaching the word of God, to another the ability to discriminate in spiritual matters, 
to another speech in different tongues and to yet another the power to interpret the tongues. Behind all these gifts is the operation of the same Spirit who distributes to each individual man as he will. And then in verse 31, you should set your hearts on the highest spiritual gifts, but I will show you what is the highest way of all. And then chapter 13, if I speak with the eloquence of men and of angels, but have no love, I become no more than blaring brass or crashing cymbal. If I have the gift of foretelling the future and hold in my mind not only all human knowledge, but the very secret of God, and if I also have that absolute faith which can move mountains but have no love, I amount to nothing at all. If I dispose of all that I possess, yes, even if I give my own body to be burned, but have no love, I achieve precisely nothing. This love of which I speak is slow to lose patience. It looks for a way of being constructive. It is not possessive. It is neither anxious to impress, nor does it cherish inflated ideas of its own importance. Love has good manners and does not pursue selfish advantage. It is not touchy. It does not keep account of evil or gloat over the wickedness of other people. On the contrary, it is glad with all good men when truth prevails. Love knows no limit to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. It is, in fact, the one thing that still stands when all else has fallen. For if there are prophecies, they will be fulfilled and done with. If there are tongues, the need for them will disappear. If there is knowledge, it will be swallowed up in truth. For our knowledge is always incomplete and our prophecy is always incomplete. And when the complete comes, that is the end of the incomplete. When I was a little child, I talked and felt and thought like a little child. Now that I am a man, my childish speech and feeling and thoughts have no further significance for me. At present, we are men looking at puzzling reflections in a mirror. The time will come when we shall see reality whole and face to face. At present all I know is a little fraction of the truth, but a time will come when I shall know it as fully as God now knows me. In this life we have three great lasting qualities, faith, hope and love, but the greatest of them is love. Follow then the way of love while you set your heart on the gifts of the Spirit. During the last world war, I was a prisoner in a concentration camp because my family, my friends and I had saved Jewish people in Holland. My sister Betsy and I were in Ravensbrück, a concentration camp where 97,000 women were killed or died and where my, also my sister was killed. We had a little Bible. It was a miracle that we had it. And every day I gave a Bible message to the people who wanted to hear the message. The Bible was a forbidden book. If they had known that I had a Bible, they should have killed me in a cruel way, but there was a great inconvenience in the room where we were together with 700 prisoners, pushed together in a small room, three tie bunks, two in, uh, or three in one small bunk and all the bunks together. And the terrible thing was that it was so dirty that very soon our clothing was full of lies. 
and that was terrible and it caused many sicknesses but it was also a help for the guards and the officers who would never come into our uh, room they were afraid to get lice from us that was good the Bible was a forbidden book but in Barak 28 we had twice a day a Bible message and God used for that lice God can use everything and what a joy to bring that message of salvation of a joy unspeakable and full of glory to these people I have never spoken so often about heaven and oh what a joy that there is a peace that passes all understanding a happiness that is not dependent on happening now these people who came every day I had often talks with them and I never asked them when I so was talking with them I never asked say what do you think about predestination we were Dutch prisoners <laughs> and Dutch people always speak about predestination but I didn't do that in that uh, time I didn't ask the people say what do you think is the most biblical way of baptism I didn't ask them, say, what is now your idea about the millennium? A, pre, post millennium? I learned from Edwin R. that that is, an a, that is a preposterous question. Uh, you know, in these moments that 600 people every day were killed, and that we saw the smoke go up from the crematorium. In these moments we did not speak about such things. You know what, what I asked these people? I asked them, say, do you know that Jesus died at the cross for the sins of the whole world? And then she said, yes, I know it. And I asked, do you understand that Jesus died for you? And she said, yes. I do and I asked her did you make clean deck with your sins did you bring all your sins to Jesus and then she said yes then I was so happy that I knew that and when I saw that she di disappeared that day into the gas chamber I was so happy that I knew that she was safe you know there are moments that you do not speak about the second best only about the best and now I know it we are not standing at this moment in front of a gas chamber and a crematorium but everyone who has brains knows that we are living in a very dangerous world and tonight I hope to speak about the securities in the midst of the insecurities for that is the message that America needs and that's the message that the whole world needs now I have traveled now over 41 or I have uh, worked in 41 countries and these last years I saw what the Holy Spirit is doing and giving to people who are open for the Lord Jesus and all what he is willing to give us and closed for the world and what the world is willing to give. And then I see that people get a fullness of the Holy Spirit, some call it a baptism of the Holy Spirit, some call it a second blessing, some call it a third blessing, I don't know, know, know what the people call it, but I'm so happy that I see what the Holy Spirit is doing. But I also find churches where there is a great confusion. Just because the Holy Spirit is given gifts. And I think that is the reason is because when God is given a blessing and then the Holy Spirit then the, the devil is scared to death 
The devil doesn't like spirit-filled Christians and spirit-filled churches. And he will do his utmost to bring separation between these people. And perhaps I have not to tell you, but uh, I think all of us know that some people say you cannot have the fullness of the Holy Spirit without the gifts of tongues. And others say you can have the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit without tongues. And I believe that it is not good to quarrel about it. Just enjoy it. And what the other people is concerned, just love them. And we have heard when you have the gifts without love, then you have nothing at all. And don't criticize and don't quarrel about it. Don't use the time for quarreling about the gifts when the world and the church and everyone is hungry for the, for the fruit of the Spirit, love. Sometimes I use this illustration, just imagine that your house is on fire and that the firemen come and then there is a very clever fireman who gathers all the other men around him and stands in the corner of your room and gives a very good lecture about best methods of extinguishing flames. What is that? That's a crime. Just imagine that one says, hey, listen, I think my uniform is far more import, uh, more uh, practical than your uniform. What is that? At that moment, it is a crime. My friends, the world is on fire, on flames. The world is dying. There is a terrific uh, fight. And you are standing in the midst of that fire. And now to quarrel about the gifts of the Spirit can be a crime. But listen, isn't it important? The best method of extinguishing uh, the flames. Isn't it important that you have a good uniform? Yes, but there are times that you don't quarrel about, but you do nothing but put out the flames. And this moment we have now in our churches and in our world. And I hope that we will get a new vision on what it means that you and I are called to be the light of the world in perhaps the most dangerous moment of the whole world history. That is doing nothing else but winning souls and bringing the, the Christians to a realization that the Holy Spirit fullness is for everyone. And that is not quarrel about it, but just love. And now I will tell you something of what I have learned about that love of God. I didn't know that there were in the original language two words for love. Philia and Agape. And in that time that I didn't know that, I did not like to read 1 Corinthians 13 because I compared my love with this beautiful love. And my love was so inadequate and so small and so powerless. When I compared it with this beautiful love, and then I read, I heard it about that there are two kinds of love, the human love and, the, and God's love. And I read in Romans 5, 5 that the love of God is shed abroad into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And then I understood this love is not a human love that we must produce. It is just the love of God, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that's for you and me because of Romans 5, 5. And I learned to thank God for Romans 5, 5. And it was really in the, that surrounding of hatred where I was surrounded by people who had had a training in cruelties. When I was in that terrible concentration camp that I learned that God's love is in fact the one thing that still stands when all else has fallen. I didn't know that. I had to learn it. 
I remember that in the time that we were in the underground work and so many people had to hide themselves for the enemy there came a boy home he was a teenager and he was in danger because the teenagers and the men were just taken from the street and sent to the to Germany to be slave laborers and make the, gu- uh, the guns and the bombs to kill the Allied. So we did not only hide Jewish people, but we hid also uh, the young men. And Kik, the son of my friend, came home and he said, Daddy, I cannot stand this uh, life anymore. I see myself a chaste animal. Always when I'm happy in a the house, then I hear that the Gestapo is behind me. Then his father said a strange thing. He said, Kick, there is an ocean of, of God's love. Couldn't understand that. I thought he was very impractical. I had not yet learned that God's love still stands also when all else has fallen. A year later I understood it better when Nolly, my younger sister, the mother of Six children was arrested because they found two Jews in her house. And I ran to the police station and I saw her coming from the door going to the prison van that should bring her to a terrible prison where many people were killed. And I put my arms around her and I can confess you I cried. But Nolly said with a smile, God is love. Had she said, can you believe that God is love? That he allowed the enemy to bring me to a prison? I could have understood, but no. She said, God is love. And in the prison then, she wrote on the wall, Jesus is victor. And coming into the prison, there were five women, and they said, don't you cry? We all cry when we come for the first time into a prison. But all he said, no, I don't. Cry, God does not make mistakes, that he allowed the enemy to bring me here. You see, she saw the things as it were from God's point of view. And she knew that God's love still stands also when all else has fallen. And a year later, she was set free very soon, after six weeks already, but a year later she was again arrested when my old father, with all his children, and a grandson and 50 friends were arrested. And when Betsy, my older sister, and I came in that terrible destruction camp Ravensbrück. And there we stood on roll call every morning. Of on three hours, from 3.30 till 6.30 in the icy cold mornings. Some of the guards who were on duty had to stand there with us and some used that time to demonstrate their cruelties. And one morning I could hardly bear to see and to hear what there happened in front of me. And suddenly a skylar came and started to sing in the sky and all the prisoners looked up and listened to the bird song. And when I looked at the bird I looked at the sky and I thought that Psalm 103 as high is heaven over the earth so high is God's mercy and love over all that fear him and suddenly I saw it oh love of God how deep and great far deeper than man's deepest hate And God sent that skylar daily during three weeks, exactly during roll call time, to turn away our eyes from the cruelty of men unto the ocean of God's love. Where did I get that uh, expression, the ocean of God's love? It was from George Fox. He once had a vision. And he wrote, I saw an ocean of darkness and death, but an infinite ocean of light and love which flowed over the ocean of darkness. In that I saw the infinite love of God. And it is at the cross 
at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my sins rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And in 1 John 4, 9 we read to us the greatest demonstration of God's love for us has been sending his only son unto the world to give us life through him. And 1 John 3, 16 we know and to some extent realize the love of God for us because Christ expressed it in laying down his life for us. And that love of God is the greatest reality. Some time ago I was just making clean deck with my sins. I needed it. I knew there was something in me that was not good. You know, so a little bit dark. And that's not... That is not the standing of a child of God. We are children of light. And I said, Lord, show me if there is perhaps a hidden sin. And the Lord showed me some sins. And I just claimed the promise of First John 1, 7 and 9. And I confessed him and he forgave. And the blood of Jesus cleansed me. What a joy. And I said, Lord... Is there still anything between you and me? And God said yes. And I waited and listened. And I thought now I will hear something that I have forgotten. Do you know what God said? My love. And suddenly I saw it. I was still thinking a sin that was between God and me. But God said, my love is between you and me. Wasn't that a joy? My friends, God's love is the greatest reality for a child of God. And God's love still stands also when all else has fallen. And here in America things can fall. And that's why we must realize it. And we must see the reality. And I like to pray with an open Bible and say, Father, you have said it, now you must do it. And God likes it. For he has meant business with the 17,000 promises in the Bible. And he likes it when we mean business with his promises. And in that terrible camp full of hatred and cruelty, the Holy Spirit taught me a prayer. A thank you for Romans 5, 5. And when the cruelty around me brought hatred in my heart and bitterness, he taught me this prayer, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who is given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love in me is victorious over the bitterness in my heart and the cruelty around me and there was no room for bitterness but it is perhaps what Paul should call in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 the foolishness of God but it is so that the highest potent of God's love is available in everyday life Life has perhaps 30 big crises, but 30,000 small crises. And the great joy is that the Bible says, whatever happens, make sure that your everyday life is worthy the gospel of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.27 and Ephesians 5.2 Live your life in love. The same sort of love which Christ gives us and which he perfectly expressed when he gave himself in sacrifice to God. A lady came to me and told that she had such a difficult life. Her husband was so dark and she said when I'm in the same room with him it is as if there comes a cloud of darkness over and into me. That is suffering. 
And I taught her the prayer that the Holy Spirit had taught me in the concentration camp. And I said, when you are together with your husband and you feel that darkness, thank God for Romans 5, 5 and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who is given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love in me is is uh, victorious over the darkness in my husband. Later I met her and she said, my husband is quite changed. Of course her husband was changed. She had acted God's victorious love. And a bird cannot know that it can fly before it uses its wings. And we cannot experience God's love in our hearts before we act it. A teacher could not manage his class and I taught him the same prayer thank you Lord not oh Lord bring into my heart your love no thank you Lord for Romans 5 5 you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who has given to me and thank you Father that your love in me is victorious over this difficult class and that man later I met him and he said my class is absolutely changed of course his class was changed he had acted God, victorious love, and now think of the problem that you have to face when you come back. Perhaps in your home, perhaps in your church, your office. Human love fails, or will fail on the long run, but now act God's love. And I can tell you that miracles will happen in your life. I once met a parachutist. And I said, say, what did you think when you jumped for the first time from an airplane with a parachute on your back? He said, I had no time to think much. But there were two words in my heart. It works. It works. <laughs> and I can tell you, friend, if you, when you uh, act God's love, there are three words in your heart. Hallelujah, it works. <laughs> You know, some time ago I was in Manila and I could speak for an ICL group, you know, these blessed uh, breakfast groups who reach the up and outers. And so it happened that I could speak for the big shops of uh, Manila. And I gave them a message about forgiveness and love for our enemies. I told him that there had been in my heart a battle, a battle against hatred. I told him that when I was in the underground work, there came a man to me and said, my wife is in great danger. She is arrested by the Gestapo and they have brought her in a prison, no, in a police station. But they will bring her next week to a prison and I'm sure they will uh, kill her for she has saved Jewish people. Please help us. I said, how can I help her? And she's already in the hands of the police. He said, I have found out that a policeman is willing to run the risk to set her free if we pay him about 600 guilders, 200, about 200 dollars. He said, but I have no money. I said, but listen, that may not hinder. Let's see, I have 200 guilders. I will give you, but come back after an hour. And in that hour I said to the teenagers who worked with me in the underground work to save the Jewish people, I said, I need money. I need 400 guilders. Now in that time Dutch people were not interested in money. They were interested to save as many people as they could. And when that man came back, he had, I could give him 600 guilders, and I prayed, Oh Lord, bless this money that his wife will not be killed, but that it will uh, really, that uh, it will succeed this policeman to set her free. That man was a quisling. He was a Dutch man who in secret worked together with the enemy. His wife was not at all in a prison. But he, the enemy had said, find out if Corita Mom really saves Jewish people. And he thought, I can find it out and in the same time make some money. 
and he made some money. He went home with 600 guilders in his pocket, but five minutes later the Gestapo surrounded our house and we were all arrested. And I heard that that man had betrayed us. I hated him. But I know that Jesus tells us to love our enemies. And I said, oh, Father, in Jesus' name, forgive me my hatred. And the two things happened that always happen, that you bring a sin to God in Jesus' name. First, he forgave me. And second, he cleansed my heart from the hatred Amen. with his blood. And when the blood of Jesus does a job, he does a good job. <laughs> Instead of hatred, I felt in my heart the fruit of the Spirit, love. And God's love is even love for your enemies. And love for lovers is good. Love for neighbors is better. Love for enemies is best. And you never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you love your enemies. Amen. That man was sentenced to death after the war. Because by his betrayal, he had been the reason that many Dutch people were killed. And when I heard that he was sentenced to death, I wrote him a letter. And I wrote, your betrayal has meant the death of my old father, who died after ten days in prison. He was 84 years old. My brother, his son, my sister died. My other sister and I have suffered terrible in three prisons but both of us have forgiven you and that is a fraction of the forgiveness that waits you when you receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior and bring him your sins and I sent him a New Testament and underlined the way of salvation and that man accepted the Lord Jesus as his Savior and he was brought to death but reconciled with God so I told about that and after I was through, the president of that breakfast group thanked me. And then he turned to the group and he said, Friends, I am so glad that at last I have met someone who can love her enemies. If there were only more Corrie and Booms in the world, we should very soon have the brotherhood of men. I was furious. Now I had told half an hour these people that I could not love my enemies and I could only hate them, but that it was Jesus who did it. And now it is nonsense. I had to remain decent, so I said, now may I uh, say one minute? Uh, other small, uh, one minute uh, message he said go ahead I said my friend when I try to let the stick stand on my hand do you think I have success it is not the nature of a stick to be able to stand but I can have it stand on the top of my finger now it stands solidly why because my hand keeps it when I try to love my enemies my sinful nature and the power of the devil makes me hating and hating again. But when I surrender to the pierced hands of Jesus, wounded for my transgressions, his hand will keep me from falling and will once present me blameless and with unspeakable joy in the great day and give me now already love for my enemies. So, uh, so far it was all alright, but what came after that, it was not alright. When I talked with this medical doctor Garcia, I was so sharp and I was so angry. I said, now tell me, do you tell every week such nonsense to your breakfast group? Did you really listen to me or didn't you listen at all when I told you that I could not love my enemies? More courage than bones the world needs. Do you know, do you realize that Corrie and Rome without Jesus Christ is a danger for the world. Now what I said was not so bad, but how I said it was very bad. <laughs> when I came in the home of the missionary, he said, Corrie, what's the matter with you? Has there happened something? I said, yes. And I told what had happened. He said, my, now that's good. Now Dr. Garcia has at last heard what he uh, should uh, hear. I said, no. 
What I said was not so wrong, but the way I said was very wrong. He said, no, I uh, write him a letter and I wrote him, Dr. Garcia, I'm so sorry for what has happened this morning. I'm so sorry that I used my anger to tell you something we did not agree about. There was an ocean of God's love available to tell it to you, and I used my anger. Will you please forgive me? And that man went to the telephone and he said, Miss Tambom, I came home from the breakfast group and I said to my wife, now I have had a scalding like I have not had since my school days. And the terrible thing was that Corrie Tambom was right. And I didn't know what to answer her. You know, Miss Tambom, I felt so unhappy till your letter came. See? I have never realized that there is an ocean of God's love available for us. My, I'm far richer than I, was, uh, than I knew. <laughs> now this man uh, had to realize that, but do you and I realize it? Perhaps you have to tell some, something to one of your congregation. And when you do it in anger, I can tell you it does not help and correct. But there is an ocean of God's agape available. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will give you so much love and it will help these other people. Oh, let us not live like beggars but like king's children. And I can tell you it works. It works. God's love. There was a pastor in Harlem, the hometown town where I was, and he said, every Sunday there comes a little feeble-minded boy, Toontje, in my church. And that boy always sits on the front pew. And I often said to my wife, Toontje doesn't understand one of my beautiful sermons, but he is so faithful. He is there every, sun- every Sunday. But he said, once I spoke about God's love through Jesus Christ. And he said, suddenly I saw in the face of that boy an expression of great joy. Don't you understood God's love? Now in my little booklet, Common Sense Not Needed, you can read about the work that I did before the war when I had a Bible class for feeble-minded people. And I experienced that they can never hear too much about God's love. And that pastor told, I had forgot the rest of the audience and only spoke to Tony about that great love of God in Jesus Christ. And said, the next day I said to my wife, I will go to, to Tony and I will know if at last he has understood one of my sermons. But when I came in Tony's house, the mother told me that the boy had died in his sleep. And he said there was an expression of celestial joy on the dead face of that boy. I believe, he added, I believe that his heart has broken by joy because he would contain too much of God's love. And I can tell you if you and I would try to contain that ocean of love, our heart could break by joy. But when we give room for the Holy Spirit, he gives us fast and strong hearts that we can have more and more. And Emmy Carmichael said, put together all the tenderest love you know of, the deepest you have ever felt and the strongest that has ever been poured out upon you. And heap upon it all the love of all the human hearts of the world. And then multiply it by infinity. And you will begin, perhaps, to have some faint glimpses of the love and grace of God. Two old Negroes saw for the first time an ocean. And one said to the other, just look, what all that water. But the other Negro said, yes, but brother, we aren't seeing nothing yet. This is only the top. There are depths of love that we cannot see 
not know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. We can only see a little of the ocean when we stand at a rocky shore. But out there beyond the ice horizon there's more. There's more. We can only see a little of God's love and a few rich treasures of his mighty store. But out there beyond the ice horizon there's more. There's more. And then when Jesus face to face I see and at his lofty throne I bow the knee. Then of his love in all its breadth and length, its height and depth, its everlasting strength, my soul will sing, the best is yet to be. But now already God's love still stands, also when all else should fall. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus that you have brought into our hearts God's love through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And thank you, Father, that your love in me, listen, Lord, who says in me, is victorious over that problem that waits me when I come in my work, in my home, in my hospital. And Lord, you know that I have tried to overcome it with human love, and it failed. But thank you, Lord, that your love still stands, also when all else has fallen. Holy Spirit, teach us to act God's love. Amen. Thank you.